right, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I want to thank you again for giving me this opportunity to share your word today. And I just pray that you speak to me and through me, Lord, that the people here might be blessed, that they might have a better understanding of your love for them and how you desire to, to uh, work through them for the saving of souls, Lord, of other people. But Lord, first we must understand your greatness, your love, and I just pray that that might be accomplished today. Guide us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I know many of you have read the parable of the sower. And so I wanted to bring some things out in this parable that many have not considered. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 8, verse 4 and 5. Luke 8, chapter 4, or Luke 8, verse 4 to 5. And the Bible says, And when a great multitude had gathered, and they came to him from every city, he spoke a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and he sowed, and some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. So in this parable in Luke 8, you have a sower, and it says that a great multitude had come to him from where? Every city, right? So Jesus is speaking to a multitude of people from many different backgrounds because they're coming from all different cities to come hear him. And the context of Luke 8, prior to Jesus teaching this parable, the first few verses says that Jesus actually had come and was traveling to every city. And so Jesus was preaching and teaching to all the different cities, and then a great multitude actually came to him. And so he tells them a parable. It says, a sower went out to sow his seed, and he sowed, some fell by the wayside, was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on the rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up, and it was choked. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and it yielded crop a hundredfold. And when he said these things, he cried, He who has an ear, let him hear. Now, Jesus is saying this must be really important because he says, if you have ears, then hear this parable. And there was good ground, but seed fell on how many different types of ground? You have the wayside, the stony ground, the thorny ground, and you have the good ground. So how much... Seed fell on different types of ground. Four. And out of the four types of ground, only one ground produced a crop that survived and grew a hundredfold. So if you are into math, simple mathematics, what are the statistics of the probability of being the good ground? 25%. So that means Jesus is speaking, listen now, to people from all different types of cities, or all different cities, all different people groups. They're traveling to come see him. And Jesus says, if you have ears, hear this, because only 25%, only a quarter of you are going to make it. Think about that. Now, when, now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So he says, one quarter of you won't make it because of, he says, the devil comes and takes away what has been sown in your heart lest you should believe and be saved. So that means that 
people heard, a quarter of the people heard Jesus speaking. They had opportunity, but because they were deceived by Satan, right? Satan interfered, and they chose to, they chose to fall away. But the ones on the rock are those when they hear or receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while and in time of temptation they fall away. So you could say these are church members, right? These are people, Christians. These are people who have joined Jesus. They're excited about what they've heard. It says they receive the word with joy. This is exciting, right? It says they believe for a while, but in time of temptation, they fall away. Temptation is also, uh, in other versions, it's trials. Trials, right? So trials and tribulation. When, when things don't go as good as you expected them to go when you first started out. And in time, it says they fall away. And so Jesus speaks to another quarter, so now we're up to 50%, right? And says, you're not going to make it because of this. And he says, he who has an ear, let him hear, because Jesus wants everyone to be saved. And he says, but these are, these are the things that happen in life that are going to cause some people not to be saved. And I, I think I have skipped a verse here. Verse, let's see, wayside, verse 14, I have it memorized. Verse 14 says, those that fell on the weedy ground, right, the cares of this world, the riches of this world, causes them to fall away. So the weeds choke them out. And so in verse 14, you have opportunity to you heard the word of God, but because of the cares of the world, maybe it's finances, maybe it's I got to take care of this, maybe I got to do this, maybe I don't have time to follow Jesus, right? If you remember the, the um, parable of the wedding feast, God invites everyone to the feast, but they said, I just got married, I don't have time to come, right? I'm building a house, I don't have time to come. I'm, I'm doing this, I don't have time to come. I don't have time. And so uh, there's that aspect of it. Or it could be the riches of the world, right? Uh, we have the rich young ruler in that sense. Here's a young man who has great possessions. And he says, Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And he says, go sell all that you have and follow me and uh and you shall have riches in heaven and he went away sorrowful that's right so that's three groups of people that's 75 percent of the people that are coming to hear jesus that aren't going to make it if they don't hear what he has to say but it says in verse 15 but the ones that fell on the good ground are those who having heard the word with what? A good, or excuse me, a noble and good heart. They keep it and they bear it with patience. So the key, key word out of all of this is patience. See, fruit bearing doesn't happen overnight. And unfortunately, a lot of good members of the Christian church, even the Seventh-day Adventist church, might not uh, read this text enough because when people are new members or they've returning members at that, they might say, well, you still have this in your life. You're still doing this. You're still doing that. And the key is patience. Sometimes we can push people out of the church, right? We need to have patience. But the other key is they heard the word with a noble and good heart. 
And I know you've, many of you have read this parable, and this is actually what we're going to focus on the most, is the different types of ground. What constitutes a good and noble heart? Because remember, Jesus is telling this to all the people, and only 25% of them are going to have good and noble hearts. So the question is, how, how do you have a good and noble heart? How do you get that? So we have the types of the ground. We have the wayside, the stony, the weedy, and we have the good. Just a quick review. The, weedy, the wayside, the devil takes away what was sown. They believe with joy, temptate, but through temptation and trials, they fall away. In the weedy, they hear, but are choked out by the cares, riches, and pleasures of life. In the good ground, they hear and keep it, but they bear fruit with patience. That's right. So what is the wayside exactly? Have you ever wondered that? What is the wayside? We understand stony and weedy, but what is the wayside? Well, what do we have a picture here of? A road. Yeah, exactly. Have you ever noticed that uh, flowers and weeds don't really grow well on roads? I'm not talking about ash, asphalt. I'm talking about gravel or dirt roads. Have you ever wondered why? Do they spraying pesticide on the road all the time? No. What's, what's, why won't it grow? Yeah, it's being used. It's being trampled down, right? I have, a two, I have two outdoor dogs, and uh, they, they walk the perimeter of their fence, and there's nothing that grows on that perimeter. And I, I'm getting tired of my grass being killed because I have like, um, you know, like a, a perimeter of just bareness. <laughs> so I actually, uh, what I did is I put turf down so that it actually looks nice, and so they can travel the turf, and it'll always look the same. But that's right. It's trampled down. But notice the sower. Did the sower make a mistake by throwing the seed on the trampled down ground? Did he make a mistake? Does God make mistakes? Then why even invest your time if you're guaranteed to have no success on the wayside? Okay. Okay. Remember, what are we talking about? We're not actually talking about the wayside. We're talking about people. What this is saying, what Jesus is saying is everybody deserves a chance at salvation. Every single person. No matter what their background and no matter what their probability of success is. Every single person deserves and has a right to the gospel. And the chances are slim that anything will be produced, but Jesus is the sower, and God says, everybody, the seed, the word of God goes to everyone. And so for you and I, what does that mean? We got to think twice about how we, if we think, okay, that person's more likely to have success, or that person's more likely to have no success, we, we got to be careful of being picky and choosy, right? Everybody deserves a chance to hear the gospel. Stony ground. Yep, you've seen weeds grow out of stones, right? But it's harder, because the stones, the, the, the root doesn't have a lot of uh, opportunity to, uh, to get a firm foundation. And so it says through trials and tribulation, right? They, the sun scorches it and it dies. So a Christian might ha go through trials and tribulation. And as a Christian, you might expect trials and tribulation to come from your religion, uh, persecution, religious persecution, right? Maybe the government is saying you don't have the right to to freedom of worship anymore. You don't have a right to keep the Sabbath anymore. You have to keep Sunday. We understand that. But 
it's, I would tell you, nine times out of 10, actually I'll go seven, uh, 7.5 times out of 10, because that's what the number actually is. Statistically, in the Seventh-day Adventist church, 75% of the people that leave the church, the Christian church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, is not because of the doctrine. It's because of somebody else. Somebody offended them, or a group of people offended them, right? And so I would say the greatest persecution comes from within. You follow me? The greatest persecution comes from within. And I can tell you time and time again, people I've baptized and they get, they're so excited about their baptism, right? They receive it with joy, but they, because people within the church have offended them, they're out the back door uh, within a month or three months. And they say, why? You know, why? Jesus is saying to you today, to me, if you have ears, then you need to hear this. Because this is, happens all the time. And so how can, what, what can we do to combat, combat this issue of religious persecution within the Christian church? Key word is love, patience, right? Be a support network. Reach out, encourage, uplift, right? There's only one adversary that the Bible mentions, and that is the devil. The devil is our adversary, not your fellow church member. So we need to uplift each other uh, through prayer through interaction, right? And be patient with one another. And then we have, of course, <laughs> the weedy ground, right? Which is also common. And what is this picture of? Does anybody know what this is? Everybody, right? I picked this picture particularly because I can tell you from my own experience, if you take out a dandelion, you mow it over, right? And you're like, yes, it's gone. The next morning, I tell you those stems are back up. Yeah, exactly, with flowers. The next morning, and I'm not exaggerating, this is from experience. I'm just, I'm just amazed about how fast those weeds can grow. And, uh, and then what are these little white things on there? Those are seeds with little parachutes on them. And so they're like, oh yeah, just mow me out and then blow me to the side. You're doing me a favor because now you're spreading my seeds so I can plant more dandelions, right? So the, the dandelions are happy to be mowed down. So, but I tell you what, the cares of this life, it's difficult living in this world. It's difficult. There are many things vying for our attention. And I can tell you from my own personal experience, I heard I was up at uh, Great Lakes Adventist Academy uh, for the past two weeks. I was up there setting up equipment for their graduation and then for camp meeting. And I was testing out the speakers. I'm on the audiovisual team. I was testing out the speakers and I, I was playing a sermon by Doug Batchelor from Amazing Facts from last year. And last year I was on the soundboard uh, and so I didn't really hear the message very well because I'm pushing buttons and making sure everything's done right so I'm not concentrating on what he has to say. But as I'm testing out the speakers, I actually listened to it twice because I had two, uh, two hours of speaker setup basically, so I just put it on repeat. and. He was preaching a sermon about, uh, I think it was, in, uh, the old, it was in the Old Testament, about the word of God. And I think it was uh, the high priest, I can't remember the particular name at the top of my head, but the high priest had found the book of the law in the temple. 
he had found the book of the law in the temple, and he was so excited that he found the book of the law. Now, my question, the question Mr. Uh, Pastor Doug said, how as a high priest, the leader of the church, do you lose the word of God within the church? Right? And he went on to say that most Christians in North America have five Bibles in their home, but how many actually pick one of those up? Right? And so he was telling, he was giving the example that it's, it's just because we have the word of God doesn't mean we have the word of God, if you understand what I mean. Right? And I tell you what, that was really convicting for a pastor from the Michigan Conference because I was convicted that, man, I need to spend more time in the Word of God because I spend more time doing the work of God and less time in the Word of God. So the cares of this life may not be uh, drugs and alcohol. It could be simple as our time, right? What's vying for our attention? And it's so easy for these little weeds to spring back up. And you think you got it taken care of and something else gets you, right? And so what is the solution? The solution is get the pesticide out, <laughs> right? If you have True Green or whatever different companies that, uh, that spray, they have a particular spray just for dandelions. Did you know that? And uh, it keeps them from growing. That pesticide is the word of God, right? The more worn out your Bible is, the less worn out you are as a Christian. And the less worn out your Bible is means the more worn out you are as a Christian. The Bible keeps you from sin, but sin keeps you from the Bible. So what is this good ground? Because that is the emphasis of what we're going today. Any farmers, any gardeners, what makes good ground? <laughs> good soil? <laughs> That's what I'm asking you. What is good soil? Okay, no weeds? Nutrients? Okay. I mean, the picture's literally right in front of you. What are those in the that would be your top right. What is that top right? What is that? Compost. Compost. Yeah, that's right. And that soil is dark, right? So compost is leftover vegetables and fruits, right? And that you don't want to eat. It's compost, right? Grass clippings is compost. Um, I can tell you from my own experience Going back to the dogs, my two outdoor dogs, the grass that does grow is super green, like a really rich, dark green within their area. And then just outside their fence, it's like a light, kind of like our grass, you know, just kind of like light, some kind of brown, a little bit of mixture. But inside the dog area, it's like dark, rich green. Anybody know why? Yeah, that's right, fertilizer. The dog eats, and the dog does, and you get fertilizer, right? So you have compost. Basically, the, the dog is doing that for you. So soil. Maybe you knew this, maybe you didn't. There's actually three main types of soil. There's sand, silt, and clay. Does anybody know what makes the difference? Okay, texture, you're on the right track, Lori. It's the size of the grain, the size of the grain. Think of sandpaper. Sandpaper comes in different bit, uh, grits, right? You have a fine grit and you have a coarse grit. So sand is considered a coarse grit. It's the coarsest of these three types. And uh, so an example is you go to the beach and you find little silica and little, like, tiny rocks, and, right? They're, they're tiny, but they're still coarse. You know, it's gritty, sand is gritty. 
And if you need to get oil off your hand, you take some sand and some soap and you rub your hands together and it works. So silt, silt is just a medium grit. Basically, that's it. So you have sand is coarse, silt is medium, and then clay is fine. And so uh, fine means that it can be com more compact. So sand, let's, let's look at this. Is sand a good soil? <laughs> yeah, is sand a good soil? Let's look at the picture here. Where do you find good sand, a uh, lot of sand at? Desert, right? Arizona, right? New Mexico, Texas. You have lots of sand. You have lots of desert. And no, it's not a good soil because uh, the water drains right through it, right? Because why? It's coarse. There's lots of gaps. And so that water just drains. But something that does thrive in this area is... Yeah, cacti or cactus for plural. And cactus, what they do, or cacti, what they do is when it rains, because in the desert it doesn't rain a lot, but when it does rain, the, it, it soaks up that water instantly and stores it. And so the rest of the um, growth here is a little sparse, but then you have this huge cacti um, that looks like, man, it's doing really well. And that's because it's developed a method of to absorb that water immediately and to store it. Then you have silt. Silt is that medium grain sand, which it does a decent job draining, but it's not doesn't drain as fast as sand. But then you have something you're more familiar with, and this is clay. I remember. I used to go to my dad's softball games in the summertime. I guess it would be spring, summer time. And uh, the baseball field had lots of clay, the baseball field surrounding on the outside. And I loved playing with the clay because it was squishy and I could make things model. And I was just digging in the ground. <laughs> but I did know one thing. When it rained, there was lots of puddling. Lots of puddling because that water had nowhere to go because it could not make it through the clay. The clay was so compact that the water couldn't find a place to drain. And so what happens if you have growth in clay? Too much water. You get your plants drowned out, right? So clay is not a good soil. And then when the sun hits it, it bakes it. But the best soil is actually a combination of all three types of soil. You have sand, silt, and clay. You combine them in a mixture. And then you add, um, like I said, compost to it. But there's one more ingredient that really makes this soil stand out. Worms. Right? I was just talking about how it's up at camp, Great Lakes Adventist Academy, the Christian Academy, and they have a greenhouse there, and their tomato plants are probably 20 to 30 feet high. How do you get tomato plants 20 to 30 feet high? Well, if you ever go on a tour, which I suggest you do if you, they, they still give out tours, um, if you grab some soil, there's probably about 20 worms in one handful of soil, right? What does the worm, why is the worm so essential to uh, soil? Aeration, you got it, that's one example. What's another example? Yes, so the worms eat the compost and are basically the dogs of the soil, that's right. The worms eat the compost, and then they spit it out the back end, and they, they make it just the nutrients, basically, and the plant absorbs the nutrients. So if you want good soil, sand, silt, and clay, and compost, and worms. That's like the key ingredient right there. That really makes it rich. So now that you understand this, 
what makes the good ground? There's quite a bit of ingredients here, right? It says, but the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, they keep it, they bear fruit with patience. So to get good soil, does it take time? Absolutely. A lot of people who are farmers, they get their soil tested to find out what type of soil is, what kind of nutrients are in it, and then after they get their lab results back, they add what they need to to get that perfect soil, right? And so it's time consuming, it requires uh, work. And so what, what makes a good and noble heart? Well, a story I like to always reference to is the children of Israel who left Egypt, right? Uh, the estimation is one to two million plus or minus people. And out of those one, one to two million people that left Egypt, how many actually made it to the promised land, the original? Two. Two. Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb. So if you have time, I suggest you read about Joshua and Caleb. What, what, what stood out in Joshua and Caleb that uh, everybody else didn't have? Well, I can tell you, the children of Israel, they had morning and they had evening worship. They had the morning sacrifice, they had the evening sacrifice, and they would worship in their tents. That sounds pretty good, right? They're worshiping. Uh, but what, what is a, one thing that really stands out in your mind that the children of Israel, the original group, did often? Yes. Right? Complain. Remember the story, God had a, God made a cloud by day. What was the purpose of the cloud? They were walking through the desert. I'll give you a hint. Shade. God is generous enough to give the people shade. And I don't know if you've anybody ever live in uh, Arizona? Anybody? Oh, you, you know then. Okay, as a child. Desert temperatures are extreme. It's extremely hot during the day when the sun's out, but then it gets down really cold in the evening. It has extreme temperatures. And so in the evening, God had a pillar of fire for two reasons, to light the way, so they had a light source while they were traveling, and they also was warmth. God is a good God, right? He's leading them. But they were fed by manna, and manna was not enough, the bread of heaven, right? They wanted more. They wanted the, the foods that they used to have. And when they were thirsty, they said, where's God? Where's God? You know, he's not, he's not giving us water. And then Moses would have to turn the water or strike a rock or speak to a rock and water would gush out. But it was constant complaining. That's right. So there's two sides to this road about 75% of the people that do leave the church, they leave because of somebody, they're offended by somebody, but also keep in mind, what's your responsibility as an individual, right? As a church, what we can do is come together and support those people, but if you're one of those individuals or know or find that somebody is, you know, one of these individuals that's going away from the church, it, all, it, it sometimes can be your own doing, right? Because the key word is patience. Jesus, think about Jesus here. You know, think about Jesus here. Jesus was persecuted by the local government. That's true. But is that what really hurt Jesus the most? No. Jesus was persecuted by his closest allies. Remember, how many forsook Jesus? All forsook Jesus. 
Jesus is suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane, and all left him. And Satan was there to say, to, and speaking in his ear, this, they're not worth it. They're not worth your, your death. They're not worth your time. They don't care about you. You're wasting your time. Right? And Satan's doing the same thing to us individually, trying to discourage us and tell us that it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Leave. Just leave. Just walk away. Right? But Jesus said, not my will, but your will, Father. I don't like this. This doesn't feel good. I don't like this. But who never forsook Jesus? The Father. The Father never forsook Jesus. So keep that in mind. God will never forsake you when everybody else will. And Satan will use other people to discourage you. But God will never forsake you. He who endures to the end shall be saved. That's what it says. He who endures to the end shall be saved. So what constitutes good ground? Patience, endurance. How do we get patience and endurance? Through the study of the word, through Jesus Christ giving us hope because we study his life and see how people treated him and how he never gave up. And it says, John 17, I do not pray for these alone, but those also who will believe in me through their word. Whose word? The context, of the, the context of this is his disciples. Jesus is saying, I'm not praying for my followers alone, but those who will believe in me through their word that they might be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be one in us, that the, world might may believe, that the world may believe that you sent me. How is the world to believe that the Father sent Jesus? Through Jesus' followers, demonstrating that same love, that same patience, that same endurance that Jesus did. People see that and they say, you are different. You are different. Something has set you apart. Why are you different? And you can tell them, because I know a Savior, and he has been good to me. I know a Savior, and he has been good to me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they might be one, just as we are one. In them, I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Right? Remember, friends, a lot of people don't experience God through the Bible. They experience God through you. It says that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Show them the love of God. Show them the patience. Show them the uplifting. Be their, ad, their, their advocate, right? Not their adversary. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who, the first ingredient is, desire their good. They're not just a number. They're not just somebody to be baptized. They're not just, you know, something like, ah, I did my part. You want them to be in heaven. You want them to have a better life. You desire their good. He showed them his sympathy for them. Right? Tell me. I want to hear. I'm going to listen. I'm not going to judge. I'm going to listen. Right? He ministered to their needs. He won their confidence, and he bid them to follow me, right? He desired their good. He showed them sympathy. He ministered to their needs. Notice it doesn't say wants. Everybody has wants, but what do they really need? A lot of people are struggling, right? They need assurance. They need hope, right? 
and he won their confidence because of these things he did. Then he bade them follow me. I didn't come into the Christian church, the Adventist church, because of a Bible study. My, initially, I should say, I came initially because somebody showed me, somebody showed me what a true Christian is like, and I wanted that. I saw their happiness, I saw their joy, I saw their hope when other people were persecuting them, yet they were not discouraged. And if they were discouraged, it was very, it was very quick that they recovered. And I was an individual who was lost. I was in the world. And I'm watching this, and I say, I want that. And it was through that interaction that led me into the Adventist church, eventually through the word. So he mingled with them. Now, there's one other key ingredient. We talked about a lot about the soil. We talked about um, what constitutes the good ground, but that's not the end, right? Once you have the good ground, there's growth, and the growth produces a, a fruit or a flower. But how does that happen? Well, what is a picture on the screen? I'll give you a hint. Bees. Bees are essential to the success of the plant. Why is that? Well, as the bee goes from flower to flower, they are sucking up the nectar so they can produce honey, right? And they get pollen all over them. That's the pollen of the flower. And then the bee flies to the next flower, and guess what? pollinates that flower. What happens, you know, bees are good, right? We can all agree bees are good. But what happens once that flower is pollinated? Anybody? It dies. Yeah, it dies. After it's pollinated, it dies. Well, why does it die? Well, think of a tomato plant. A tomato plant has a flower, it's a little one. But after that flower is pollinated, it dies. And then what happens? It produces the tomato out of that flower. So before you have fruits, you have to die. Now Jesus, going back to this, this is why it's so Jesus is saying, if you have ears, then hear this parable, because this is so essential to our Christian faith, our success. Jesus did not want to die. He said, Father, let this cup pass before me. Father, let this cup pass before me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. And Jesus died on that cross for you and I. And because of Jesus' death, there was fruit. Right? No longer was Jesus the one who was preaching. It was Jesus' followers that were preaching. Jesus spread the seeds, the seeds being his disciples. And the disciples were now the preachers of the word. They were living words, showing that love of Jesus, right? And after the death of the cross, they were changed. They were transformed. They were no longer bickering back and forth, but they were unified. They were of one mind. They had one mission, and that was to finish the work that God has given them to do. But they had to die to their own wants first. So Jesus died and produced a fruit. So these little honeybees, or these bees in general, they, they're doing the work, spreading that pollen out, right? And then the flower dies, but then there's fruit. So you can see the growth here. So... These uh, bees are uh, essential, and you have three main types of bees. You have the worker, the drone, and the queen. Now, maybe you knew this, maybe you didn't, but most bees, every single one of them is female. Do you know that? Except the drone. And, I get, and you know how many drones are? 
Not very many. <laughs> there's, a, there's just a few drones, but rest of them, all the worker bees are female. All the, the queens are female, of course, and the drones are male. And the males have one purpose. They mate with a princess queen, right? They, they call it the nuptial flight, where the drones launch off and they mate with the other hives, and after they've mated, they die. That's it. <laughs> they fulfilled their purpose. But you have the worker and the queen. Now, contrary to belief, and I might give it away by that statement, who has the authority in this relationship out of these three? You would say the queen, right? The queen by name sounds like somebody in charge, someone with a position. But that's actually not correct. The queen, just like the drone, has one mission. The drone was to mate and die, and the queen has one mission, and that's to produce and die. Did you know that? Produce and die. The ones in charge are actually the workers. The workers are the ones who call the shots. How is a queen made? How is a drone made? How is a worker made? Does anybody know? Okay. Very good. So the worker bees actually are the ones who create queens and drones or other workers. They decide. And so the workers, what they do is if they want to make a queen, they, they feed them a substance called royal jelly. And the royal jelly is fed to the, the they're just, there's no difference amongst the um, genetics. It's just that they're given more steroids and more nutrients and there makes them triple the size of the workers. And it gives them a different responsibility. And so they're fed royal jelly for their lifetime and so they become queens. Workers are fed royal jelly for three days and then they're fed nectar and honey after the three days and then they are made into a worker. So what happens if a queen dies? Does anybody wonder that? The workers, they make a new one and it takes about three days to make a new one and they got their baby maker back, right? So the queen does not call the shots, contrary to belief, the workers are the ones doing the work, <laughs> calling the shots, right? And uh, just an aside here, what shape do the bees make when they make their hive? Yeah, that's right. You were going to say a honeycomb, which I thought you were going to say, but it's, the shape is a hexagon, which is a very complex shape if you see this booklet here. Right? It's not a square, it's not a triangle, it's not a pentagon, it's a hexagon, which is very structurally sound. That was just an aside. So, what happens is they're all working together and they've reached their maximum capacity in their hive. Right? When they get to 80%, right, maximum, they're, they're, they're reaching maximum uh, capacity then you, you may have seen this on a tree. What is this called? David, you know your stuff, you know? A swarm. This is called a swarm. And what a swarm is, is basically there's a decision by the workers that's saying, uh, we ran out of space. We're going to run out of space here. So they have a calculated um, exodus where they start gorging themselves on honey, on nectar, and various things. And they produce uh, two or three, I think it's like two or three queens. And one, they fight each other to decide who's going to be the victor of the new hive, the current hive. But the old bee, the old queen, with the rest of the workers, uh, they leave. 75% roughly leave the hive and they go up into a high branch. And they, it's called a swarm. And then what happens? This is what happens. The workers, the scout bees are the most experienced foragers in the cluster. An individual scout returning to a cluster promotes a location she has found. She uses the waggle dance to indicate direction, distance, and quality to others in the cluster. 
the more excited she is about her findings, the more excited she is about dancing. They waggle dance, they waggle their bums, right? And they're, 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 they're in this high branch, they send out scouts to scout for a new location, for a new hive, and then the different scouts come back with their waggle dance to promote their location. The more excited she is about her findings, the more excited she dances. If she can convince other scouts to check out their location she found, they take off, check other proposed sites, uh, check out the proposed pro 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 site, and may choose to promote that site further upon their return. Several different sites may be promoted by different scouts at first. After several hours and sometimes days, slowly a favorite location emerges from that decision-making process. In order for a decision to be made in a relatively short amount of time, the swarm can only survive for about three days on the honey on which they gorge themselves before leaving the hive. A decision will often be made when somewhere around 80% of the scouts have agreed, popular vote, upon the location and or when a quorum of 20 to 30 scouts is present at a potential nest site. What does this sound like? Yeah, it sounds like a board meeting or business meeting, right? Who's doing the decision making? The queen? The workers. The workers, 80% have to agree. There has to be a quorum of 20 to 30 bees at the site, right? And once they've made a decision, then they take off and they follow the scouts to that new location. And then they set up shop at that new location. Basically, what you have here is a church plant, right? It's amazing what God can teach us through nature, through soil, and through bees. And so you have each one working together. Bees, if bees, they only live uh, a few uh, weeks, to my understanding. The workers do. The queen can live up to four years. But the goal is, they have one goal in mind, and that is to reproduce and plant more hives. So going back to our dandelion example, the dandelion doesn't care if you mowed them over. They're actually excited about that because you did them a favor. I planted my seeds. The goal of the Christian church is to finish the work, to show the world that God is real and that God is living in your heart, right? So it says in Matthew 28, 18, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Remember, all nations, even the wayside. Everybody deserves an opportunity. Baptizing the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to deserve all things that I've commanded you. And lo, guess what? I am with you, even when everybody else forsakes you. Quick example, Apostle Paul. Saul becomes Paul. He becomes the greatest evangelist the Christian church has seen, uh, planting churches in new territories, planting churches to the Gentiles, the, the non-Jews. And when Paul gets back from his missionary journey, he's persecuted by the other apostles. Did you know that? He's persecuted by the other apostles. But what does Apostle Paul do? Does he just pack up shop and says, I'm done here? No. He does not give up. He dies. And Paul says this. He says, I have ran my race. I have a crown laid up for me. Nobody's going to take that crown from me. I have finished the work that Jesus has given me to do. I have completed that race. And Paul is an encouragement to each of us, especially to those who are discouraged from within. Don't give up. By patience, run your race that Jesus has given to you personally, and he will never forsake you. But he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, make disciples, finish the work, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son, teach them the things that I've shown you. And it's not talking about death 
state of the dead. It's not talking about the truth about hell. It's not talking about the sanctuary in heaven. It's talking about the character of Christ. Show them the love of God, that they might see God in you. And when this work is finished, when this gospel has been preached to all the world, then the end will come. Once our work is finished, God creates a new heavens and a new earth. God creates, and the, then the people say amen, and they're excited about it, and they said it was worth it because there's no more sin, there's no more suffering, there's no more sorrow or pain. God wants us to see the bigger picture. Sometimes we get so tunnel vision and we forget why are we even here? What are we doing, right? We are God's workers to finish the work. He who rows the boat has no time to rock the boat. Keep that in mind. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share your word about the good soil and about um, dying to self, to our own desires, that you might live through us and that we might be your missionaries, that people might see you living in us and they might say, I want that. I need that. Might we encourage and, and uplift people instead of discouraging is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Page 1, page 569. Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Let's all stand, please. <laughs> 